All righty, very good. And actually, you uh, you might want to try to say if you look over here, that that's the camera. Oh, okay. Just so. Oh, I see. Yeah, and you know, if you move out, that that's fine. But in any event, uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I want to thank uh, Stan KD One uh, LE for his uh, for his upcoming presentation. Uh, I'll, I'll let Stan introduce himself, but he's going to be doing a, a ham sci uh, talk uh, this evening. And the timing of this talk is actually uh, pretty important because of the uh, couple events that are going to be upcoming, and I'm sure uh, Stan will tell us all about that. So, uh, uh, whenever you're ready, uh, uh, Stan KD One LE. Good evening. Um, I guess everyone can hear me. And how do we know everyone can hear me? Good. Okay. Now I know how this works. All right. So I'm Stan Katie Wan Ali. Um I got well, the whole thing is about this, what we're calling the Hamsai Festival of the Eclipse. We have two eclipses coming up. Uh one this October and one in May uh next year. And they're the last eclipses till the four, 19, four, uh, 2040s. So if you want to see eclipse, full eclipses, this is or eclipses, this is it. Um, Hamsai is a group, and it's really just a group. It's not a club. It's not a 401c. It's nothing. It's just a group of people and scientists that are interested in propagation. And what we're, oh, and what we're trying to do and what the whole purpose of what's going on is to collect data about the effects of the eclipse on the ionosphere. And so all of this that I'm going to be talking about is geared towards that. Unlike, say, a scientific experiment where you have a theory, you, you make an experiment, you do some measurements, you decide if your theory was good or whatever, we don't have... When no particular question or theory in question. There's an event that's going to happen. That's the experiment. And we're going to try to collect as much data as we can for questions we don't know yet. There may be questions next week. There may be questions in 20 years. But this data is going to be available to scientists and atmospheric experimenters or scientists, basically, investigators. Um, right now, well, why don't, I, why don't I move on and we'll try to cover some of these things. But some of the points in this slide, whether you're a contester, just an HF operator, a shortwave listener, or if you really want to get into it with some other aspects of radio, there's all sorts of opportunities to participate here. Well, oh, okay. All right. I'm not going to read the slides. Uh, if you want to read about me, you can. I was um, president of Envark for many years, probably 15. I've been a ham since whatever, 1993. I had a lot of my working experience was in. Um, test, test equipment building, say, and test equipment maintenance at like Raytheon and Polaroid. It was manufacturing equipment. Um, we got involved in this because one of the members of our club or several members of the club actually work up at, at Haystack. If you know what Haystack um, is up in Westford where they do atmospheric research. And so back in 2017, um, some researchers from the New Jersey Institute of Technology got availability of a satellite to do some passes during field day. And 2017 and 2018, we were one of a number, a few clubs, there were I think about a half a dozen across the US under the path of the satellite. <clears throat> and during the, portion of the pass that was near us, we had to transmit for about 15 or 20 minutes. We would transmit in CW. And the purpose was to study the atmosphere or the ionosphere through the ionosphere. We usually look at it, signals going up and coming back. They were looking at it to look through, uh, which is a little bit different. So that's when we got involved in all this. And um, 
it's carried on from there. <clears throat> one, one aspect of all of this work is none of us in our group, we started back in the, around that time, we were experimenting with Arduinos. Nobody knew anything about Arduinos. This came along and we were all working with Raspberry Pis. None of us had worked with Raspberry Pis. It's been a great learning experience all around, software, hardware, whatever. Um, so this is what HamSci is. It's just a community. Most of them are amateurs. A lot of them are actually scientists, uh, professors, scientists, and we loosely get together on Zoom once a week. We do have, they did have a workshop. We had a workshop down at the University of Scranton in, in March. There were about 125 people there, I think, 150. With a pretty broad range of uh, knowledge. I mean, some people were just, you know, I, I got the introduction and that was about it, but I learned a lot down there. Uh, the next one's gonna be out in Ohio at, uh, so this was at the University of Scranton. Next one's gonna be at Case Western next year. So this is primarily spawned by some researchers like Phil Erickson up at Haystack and some others to try to involve citizens in collecting data for science and to be involved as deeply as you care to be. Uh, it may be just operating your radio. It may be building equipment. It may be sometimes on a Thursday meeting, we may be reviewing a research paper, which actually gets our names on the research paper. Uh, they've tried to be um, involve everybody and give everybody credit for what they do. This isn't one-sided. Um, so my name's on a couple of research papers, one that's get just was announced is going to be published or is being published now. Um, okay, <laughs> I'm trying to trying to look up there. I should look here. Okay. So this is the two eclipses that are coming up. Um, the one this year is going to start in the Northwest and sweep down across Texas, uh, which is not over us, although we'll have some, we'll be able to see some effect of it. Uh, and then next year it comes up over Texas and comes out over, I think over Maine. So it will be very much over us. In any case, um, they're trying to collect as much data, amateur radio data, during these eclipses as they can. And so we're promoting this, what we're calling the festivals of the eclipse, ionospheric science. So everybody knows, you know, the effects of, the, of an eclipse. You can have a full eclipse and it all depends on where the moon is. I probably don't need to go too much into this. If the moon's closer, well, we can have the two cases. We can have a fully obscured sun or we can have partially where you essentially see, I can just skip right ahead to this. So that's the two choices. The annular where the moon is in a place further away so it doesn't completely cover the sun or in 2024 where it'll be completely obscured. So this is the areas they're trying to study or they're interested in. It all should be familiar. You know, the uh, E layer, D layer, F1, F2, or F when it's uh, nighttime. The eclipse is gonna be daytime, daytime in this October. I don't recall what the time is for the, well, if it's not daytime, you're not gonna see it anyway, but. So it's just saying, this is a, a bit of a, a difference from, you know, the sun moves across the US, the, the, the gray line moves across every day. Um, but this is very focused as, as the, uh, the dark spot moves across 
across the country. So this is going to be a different case. And one of the goals is across this path to have stations either side of the darkest part of the path. So they're going through the ionosphere that's least effect, has least exposure to the sun. Um, these are just some of the differences in the you know, eclipse as opposed to a normal day-night transition. Um, the, this just is po pointing out that the occasion of the eclipse is something we can plan on. Um, you can't plan on solar flares. You can't plan on other events that that disturb the ionosphere to study, but we can plan on this. Now, I might mention that at this point, <clears throat> the equipment that we are running is already being used by some researchers to study the effect of solar flares on the ionosphere. Um, Christina Collins, Dr. Christina Collins, who has been working on this for quite a while, has published several papers already based on the data we've collected with what I'm going to talk about, uh, the grape receivers, a little bit later here. So this is, and I'm going to have to see how this works here. This is what it's going to look like. OK. How do I get a mouse click? Okay, I don't feel so bad. So that's day night moving across uh, the US and there's the uh, the eclipse moving down the West Coast, down across South America. They're actually gonna try to involve some amateur um, clubs from South America and, and the Central America. Primarily though, right now we're working, you know, it's all, it's primarily US right now but they have, haven't uh, <clears throat> talked with some clubs down in South America to try to get them to participate. So if we, uh, where did you do that? <laughs> yeah, not so easy. So anyway, that's what we'll see in October. Um, and so we're not in the you know the darkest part of the eclipse. Right. Oh. <laughs> so this is next year. It's going to come up across, you know, Mexico, Texas, and up the East Coast. So that's what it's going to look like next year. So <clears throat> this year, we're trying to get as many stations on the air as we can along the eclipse path. We're probably going to have maybe 50. Um, well, I'll just say as grape stations. There's also the aspect that they're trying to get as many people on the air as possible, and that's <clears throat> the solar eclipse CUSO party. And I'm going to talk about that shortly. And so they've created a few contests. We'll call them contests. Purpose really just to get people on the air. Because while you submit logs, the real purpose is for things like uh, Whisper, um, anything that gets automat automatically logged and maybe like Whisper has a richer data set uh, that can be automatically collected because those resources are already being used by researchers. 
They're using Whisper, the PSK reporter database, as well as the contest logs. But the contests are really to get people on the air. And it may be sideband CW, it may be digital modes, it may be Whisper. All of those things count because the maximum number of CUSOs of any kind is what they want. And there are some other things that are going to happen. So this mentions the, <clears throat> the CUSO party. Uh, the Gladstone signal pot spotting, yeah, Gladstone signal spotting challenge. And that's really whisper. Um, if you want to get involved to a little bit more, uh, you can build a, you know, a sounder, basically. And they call it the chirp sounder. And you have to register, and you, they set you up with a, <clears throat> a particular chirp and a time. And your station needs to be time synchronized. And your station during the eclipse will send out a chirp every so many minutes. And there will be stations that will record that. And using that, you will transmit it at an exact time. They'll receive it knowing an exact time. And they'll be able to compute the length of time that signal was in the air. And then they can decide, did it go, was it line of sight? Was it one bounce? Was it two bounces? What was the path? So you can get involved a little bit more. And then <clears throat> the great personal space weather station that we've been running for a couple of years, uh, we're continuing to expand. And I'm going to cover that a little bit more later. But basically, that's something you put on the air 24 hours a day to listen. And I'll explain that in a bit. So <clears throat> again, the, pur <clears throat> the purpose is to get as many people operating during the eclipse as, as possible. <clears throat> so that all of that data can be logged. And you can read down through here. The 2017 was kind of the beginning. There weren't you know, there weren't as many people on the air, but there were there were quite a few, and they're hoping to have more people this time for the two eclipses. Um, so kind of stating that the idea of the Eclipse, Q, Eclipse Cuso party is it's not just for fun because there's a scientific purpose behind it. Um, so they're going to collect data. Again, we don't know, you know, what it's going to be used for exactly, but you know, someday your granddaughter or somebody who's in college and looking for a thesis paper may be looking for some data on, on ionospheric research. So we don't know. But if you don't collect it now, we won't have it later. So that's the idea of pushing it forward now. <clears throat> And this is just the 2017 results. 566 logs were submitted, 29,000 CUSOs. So they're hoping to do better this year. Um, next year is going to be difficult because next year the eclipse is on a Tuesday. So it's going to be tougher, but, th but this year it's on a weekend. So hopefully this year will be good. If enough people get interested, maybe we'll get enough people on the air next year. But again, it's a problem because it's a weekday. <clears throat> Oop, they do too. So that's the, the logs. And I'll just mention, see, you can see, see that the reverse beacon network, 68, 618,000 spots and the whisper net, 630,000 spots, PSK reporter, 1.2 million. So there were a lot of spots, and they would like to have as many more. They would like to have as many as they can get. So participating in the different aspects, the contests, whisper, all of them count. In all the cases, any way you want to participate, all the information is up on hamsci.org. There's a different link for you know whether it's the CUSO party or um, Let's see, the contest, 
the chirp sounding, the whisper. All, there's all sorts of inf information up there on that website. And it's all hamsi.org. If you start typing hamsi, you'll probably get there, but hamsi.org. I'm not going to read you the rules. It's not even only part of them, but like every contest, it's got rules and it's the timing of it and whatever. <laughs> so again, it's it's attempting to appeal to anybody. Like the, the more contacts, the better. The more transmissions, the better. Could be a regular contester. Could be somebody who wants to set up a whisper station. Anyone who's seen a whisper you know, or a waterfall, just an example of a waterfall, digital modes. Uh, the nice thing about the digital modes is uh, it's it's better data than, you know, everybody's 5.9 or 5.99 in a contest. You made a contact, but we really don't know the signal strength or or timing may, may be a little bit loose, but the, uh, if you got a station that has a GPS clock stabilized and the re receiving stations are all listening with a, an accurate clock, it, it can be more valuable data. And also you transmit will whisper, it's not just one path, it might be received by a hundred stations. So they can look at lots of different paths. So this is a Raspberry Pi based, just an example of how simple it can be, a Raspberry Pi based whisper station. Um, there's all sorts of ways to do it. Uh, on the previous eclipse, our group probably set up 20 whisper stations. I had four on my front porch uh, that just ran through the eclipse. And after that, I've never run whisper again. <laughs> but um, so, it's easy enough to set up and you just you just let it run. So <clears throat> I was just transmitting. And this is a map of some of the spotters and signal paths during the eclipse. Now let me see where I am here. And you know, typical log. So again, you're looking for or hoping for significantly higher number of contacts, more the merrier, and the researchers will certainly be happy. I know <clears throat> I was I was really impressed when we went down to uh, Scranton that what I think of as college kids were really pretty pretty serious about this. I mean they're they're not just accepting book learning. They're out there, you know, and especially the seniors and the postgraduates, the you know, people going for advanced degrees are really using this data. They're, they're appreciative. And it was really fun to actually sit and talk with them. So this is just an attempt to show that during the eclipse, so the center of this graph zero zero is when at a particular location uh, the eclipse was the darkest that's when it was right overhead so you can see that this is 14 megahertz 20 meters so you can see that <clears throat> the left left side um, contacts were going out to 3,000 kilometers that's the the left axis is is the number of kilometers so contacts were going out to 3,000 kilometers. Most of the contacts were between 1,000 and 2,000 kilometers. And as oh, the, the color, the intensity from blue to yellow to or green to yellow to red is how many. So the red is the, de the most contacts. So most contacts are happening in 1,000 to 2,000 kilometers. And as the eclipse starts to move in, that's one and a half hours before it's overhead. And as it moves in, you can see that 
eventually the, the contacts start getting to be shorter as the, the ionosphere starts losing charge. And also as, as after or between one and a half an hour before, the number of contacts you know, goes down from being red to yellow. So the number of contacts is going down, the distance is going down as the ionosphere loses charge. And at zero, that was the minimum, contacts were all less than 2,000 kilometers, one to 2,000, but much less than in the earlier hour. And as the eclipse moved away, it builds back up. First, there's more contacts in the close range, and then eventually it's the, the range starts to pick back up, <clears throat> and the number of contacts based on the, the yellow changing to orange changing to red, the number of contacts picks up. In the hour and a half, it didn't really recover completely, and it's kind of spotty up there. I can't really explain that, but, um, but that's the effect you see. Now, this is an example over four bands, 14 megahertz, 20 meters being at the top, then 7 megahertz, 40 meters, 80 meters, and 160. <clears throat> so this is kind of what you'd expect. Um, 20 meters, you know, with, with good sun, got long range, lots of contacts. 7 megahertz is actually you know, shorter range. And actually when it got dark, the number of the range of the contacts actually increased. And then, it, then it, you know, it tapers off same as it, you would expect. On 80 meters, nighttime band, there's no contacts until it gets dark. And it picks up in the center and same at 160. So it all, it all seems to track, go ahead. Well, we don't know. Yeah, I mean that makes sense. I, I, there's no way to know who's, who's up and and if, what band they were on at any given time. I guess if they submitted a log, you might know the time, but I don't know that any. Yeah, they'd have to log when they didn't get a response, and yeah, there's no log of that. Yeah. Then <clears throat> another thing you can do is, I said, you can you can put up a chirp sounder. Um, again, the the attempt here is to try to establish what the path was. <clears throat> was it a, a one hop, a two hop line of sight? And they can do that by knowing when the signal was sent and when it was received, because your signal is going to be unique. And Can you hear? Oh, thank you. Can you hear that chirp sound just on? It's not playing here, but oh, because you have your audio used for. Anyway, what what the signal is? It sends your 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 call sign three times in Morse code. And then it sends a chirp, a chirp, 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 um, some number of times. And that's a, a known spectrum that it's sending. And there are stations just to receive that along the on either side of the path. So, so that they know when you sent, because you're using a GPS disciplined oscillator in your radio for timing for, on your computer to time this. You send your transmission. They can time when it was received. Now they know how long it took and they can calculate the distance it traveled. Okay, <clears throat> so this is the per Great Personal Space Weather Station. Nobody knows why it was named Grape other than, go ahead. Oh, 
but you're going to make it. Oh no, no, that didn't stay. I don't feel so bad. Is it going? I'll find this on the website to play it for yourself. Yeah, well, I tried that. It didn't work. <laughs> yeah. Well, I tried that link on the website and it didn't work. Um, they work, they're going to fix it. I had to fix it on this, you know, mine on my laptop. I got it to work, but okay. It will work there eventually. All of this is up there. So this is a, someone say something? No. This is a, what they call the Great Personal Space Weather Station. It's uh, a part of it. They said nobody really knows why they named it. The next project is called Tangerine. There was no project before this. So we decided it's the great, uh, yeah, what is it? Yeah. So the great radio amateur propagation experiment. That's what it is. Great radio amateur propagation experiment. Tangerine is going to be, well, that's even beyond. There's a grape two that is actually three of these in one system. And tangerine is beyond that. It's going to be a system and it's being built by Tapper. Uh, you can have a magnetometer, you can have multiple receivers, and you can have other instruments yet to be defined. Uh, and that's probably a couple of years off still. Uh, the grape two is going to be ne for next eclipse. It should be available for next eclipse. But this is a little board. Uh, you can see by the dimensions, it's less than an inch by an inch and a half. So it's a little bit of a challenge to build. That's all surface mount. Um, our group here in kind of Eastern Mass, Northeastern Mass, we've built about 30 of these. Um, we've been fortunate, well, we have about a dozen of them running in in the kind of Pepperell, Groton, Westford, Chelms Chelmsford area uh, on multiple bands. Uh, the, the, what, this, th what this is used for is using a GPSDO as, as a uh, called a reference frequency and an, an antenna connects to this, a GPSDO, and you monitor one of WWV's transmissions. They, they transmit on two and a half, five, 10, 15, I think maybe even 20 sometimes. But so that's a, a very stable signal, we think of at those frequencies. And at, its, at their end at Fort Collins, it is a very stable signal, but the ionosphere isn't so kind to it. So what this does is it measures the difference of the frequency of the Dopplers of the WWV signal received from what it compared to what it should be or what it was transmitted. Um, so what you do connect to this, you connect a GPS receiver and feed it with one of those frequencies, 5, 10, 15 megahertz, and feed an antenna in. And that connects to a Raspberry Pi running FL Digi. And that FL Digi has been modified to for several purposes, but one is it it collects the data on the frequency shift and creates files that get uploaded every day to a site. And I think it's actually the WWV Radio Club right now. So that's been collecting, they, it, those have been collecting data now for about two years. And as I said, Christina Collins has been writing papers and her some of her students have been working with this data. At this point, I, I jump back a little bit. Um, this is part of a bigger um, 
challenge or a bigger purpose to involve regular people in research. Uh, in this case, it's mostly amateurs, uh, and, and amateurs, a lot of them are actually researchers, but it's mostly amateurs, though not all. Um, and for the students, it may be people, it may be computer people, it may be database people, it may be mathematics, people who do mathematics, maybe people studying the atmosphere. There's, there's all sorts of people involved in this, but it's an attempt to go beyond like Skywarn or <clears throat> you know, I guess you call weather watchers that record weather every day for the weather service, Skywarn that looks for ground truth. This is trying to get regular people involved more deeply in scientific research. And right now it's amateurs, but I think there's interest in going beyond that, but this is where it's, it's kind of starting. There, there are some other groups involved with NASA and some other group, uh, some other government research, people interested in research that already are trying to do it on other subjects. So this is, is what the little grape looks like. And this is what we've been building. We are, um, they tasked us, challenged us, to build a number of these to send them out to people who didn't have one and maybe couldn't build their own because they wanted to get uh, as many as they could out on this first eclipse. Um, <clears throat> so this is a picture of what we've been building. The, the little silver thing is a GPS DO. That's a, a GPS discipline oscillator. You hook a little GPS, you know, antenna. Right there, it's a Leo Bodner, GPSDO. And when that's fed in to the little grape board, uh, the other connection to the grape board in the lower left is an HF antenna of some sort. Uh, it could be a loop, could be a dipole, minor dipoles. Uh, we have some people using loops. This generates a, a, a one kilohertz tone based on the, the numbers you've chosen. This is a El Cheapo sound card, sound device, and it goes into a Raspberry Pi, <clears throat> which runs, in this case, Raspbian uh, and FL Digi. And that automatically, every night at eight o'clock, um, ships off to the mothership about, I think, 37 megabits of data, megabytes of data, 37 megabytes. Uh, the next generation is going to ship off something like 30 gigabytes a day uh, because it's going to collect data over a much wider band than on three frequencies at once. But right now, this, this is what we're using. Uh, we've built, like I said, about 30, 15 look like this. The other ones look like rat's nests, like everybody else builds stuff. Um, we've been lucky. We've got about a dozen in right around our area through friends and acquaintances. We have one in Indiana. We have one in British Columbia, uh, four in North Carolina, a couple in Florida. So we're trying, just our little group is just trying to help get these out, but there are other ones out in the out already. This, this changes over from <clears throat> This generation is now going to no longer be FL Digi. Uh, they're switching over to Ubuntu, so I have to learn another language. And uh, Digital RF, if you're familiar with Digital RF, it's a software package that you can build a radio by dragging blocks around. And one of the things about it is one of, some of the blocks you drag is how, what the output you want. And eventually what they want the output to be in a scientific type uh, data structure. And it's called a digital RF file. It's actually a format developed up at MIT Haystack, probably for their black hole uh, studies. But it's a way to save the data that can be researched in a very, very good way. And they have tools to analyze the data. 
the dig the uh, FL Digi data is just comma delimited CSV file, and it's hard to it's hard to mix it all up or search across things. So the ultimate goal here is to get it into this new form, which these are going to run. Um, I have one. There's a couple running in the country right now. I have one right now. It doesn't look like this. It looks like a rat's nest. But that's the direction they're going. Um, the reason they're doing this, besides the fact that it probably makes sense as far as keeping the data in a best usable form is that this is being funded at least partially through the National Science Foundation and NASA. And so they've set a what what they want. They they made a proposal, Hamsai made a proposal, and the National Science Foundation and NASA wants certain things. And they've committed to having a certain number of stations on the air and have the data in a certain format. Um, these stations now <clears throat> are going to send the data to the University of Alabama, which is going to maintain the database. And that's where I've been sending my data now for about half a year. So we're working towards that as a permanent um, storage place. Well, this, this, this creates under this one a file a minute with 60 digital RF files in each one, and then it rolls it up, and, and all that get, still gets shipped off at 8 o'clock at night. Takes it, I don't know if it takes on my uh, cable, it takes probably five minutes to upload my data. The grape two is going to be more difficult. Those are actually going to have, <clears throat> these run strictly on an SD card on the, on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, the new, next one runs on a hard drive, a four terabyte hard drive, because they think they may have to ship them back, <laughs> ship drives back with the, the amount of data. If you have uh, anything less than a good internet connection, you probably can't keep up with the, the size of the files at that point, because I think it's somewhere around 30 gigabytes a day. So another challenge is, you know, the, re the repository has got to be something well maintained. And so again, they went to the University of Alabama. Students at the University of Alabama are generating or creating uh, tools to access, access the data. Um, as well as working with the, the well, the person I contact, Bill Engelke, uh, they work for their students of his. And so they're working on software, on mathematics, on analysis tools. So it involves a lot of different dis disciplines. And a lot, all of these are students, or a lot of these are students, and some of them are being partially funded out of this these grants. So, um, I think it's worthwhile. It's worthwhile, and it gives them some real scientific experience. So this is explaining, I think, what I really covered. Um, this, the the beacon in this case is WWV, and we're receiving. This is uh, a station. I think this might be. There is a station in, in Fort Collins, Colorado, that's very close that they use as a reference. So actually he, I think that's him, but he's, he's actually line of sight. But in this case, this is what we're typically looking at. Um, the signal's bouncing off the ionosphere, <clears throat> not bouncing, it's being refracted by the ionosphere and coming back <clears throat> and we measure the difference in the frequency. Um, if you want to build something, again, it's all on the hamside.org website. And under grape is uh, instructions or how, how to set one of these stations up. There's parts lists if you want, and places if you want to order parts. Um, but it's it's all on the hamside website. And so if you think that WWV's 10 megahertz signal is 10 megahertz, this is 10 megahertz along this line. But this is what we hear. 
this is minus a half a <clears throat> half a hertz. Um, the grape system measures down to millihertz. That's what we're trying to measure to. But this is hit minus half a second, and this is well, this is now uh, now nah, half a hertz. So this is a hertz higher than 10 megahertz, and this is half a hertz below. But one thing you can see here, this is this is this is uh, sunrise here, the dotted line. So as the sun starts to come up on 10 megahertz, and I don't know what all these different peaks are, but as the ionosphere starts to get charged, it effectively is moving down. To think about it, but as it gets charged, the, si the signals get refracted from a lower level and it's gradually moving down. So that's the train coming towards you where the whistle is increasing in pitch. So the signal, the pitch is increasing. And then what we have is the D and E layer getting energized and we start losing signal. Um, or <clears throat> but that's this, this pretty much happens every day. Although if you have a solar flare, you'll see wild gyrations on here. Uh, much they'll go off the off the screen on top and bottom, and again that's something that they're researching. But this is just the stations here in well in Eastern Mass, uh, Chelmsford, Harvard, Groton, Pepperell. Oh, we have one in Maine, uh, New Vineyard, Maine, Harvard, Groton. So these are the ones we consider the Northeast, and we plot these every day. Or one of the guys. <clears throat> wrote some scripts to plot these every day. We plot all of them. We plot the Northeast. We plot some certain ones that cover the whole country. So there's, we call it the wide group. It's in the East Coast, in Indiana, uh, I think Florida, Florida or North Carolina is in there, and then British Columbia. So you can see, and they're very different. I mean, in the first place, everything's time shifted because the sun is different. But um, the West Coast has WWV and WWVH, so there's a complication. Um, but this is what we see every day, typically, um, on what you would consider a very stable 10 megahertz reference. I didn't I didn't do a signal strength one. No, I didn't do a signal strength one. We there's also there's two two major plots. There's the um the Doppler shift and there's signal strength, and that's a different type of curve, but uh and that very much depends on frequency. The five megahertz we have a couple of nodes on five megahertz, they just disappear during the day and they're up for a little bit at night and you know the things you would expect in terms of propagation. So this, this is kind of a summary. Um, the idea of the eclipse um, FUSA party and all of these things is to collect data and trying to make it a little bit of fun so we get as many people to participate as we can. Um, there's a lot of different ways to participate. Just contest, whisper, Chirp sounders, uh, personal space weather station. And we don't really know specifically what it will be used for, but um, at, at the conference, there was, a, there was a guy there, and I didn't understand much of what he was saying, but he he's a person that creates models of the ionosphere. And... He's using this data, some of this data, he uses other data, but he uses this data to see as his model working to what we really see. And the more points he has to use, the more he can test his model. So more data is better. <clears throat> uh, another aspect, uh, when I was talking about the um, the ideas, one of the challenges is, how do you 
how do you merge almost random located data? Well, let me back up a little. We have Millstone Hill, or actually, not Millstone Hill, because that's the other site. We have Haystack, two sites up there on the hill. Haystack that does atmospheric research. They have a sounder that does ionospheric soundings. And that's one point, straight up, one point. There are five others in the country. And there are some other sounders in the country, but there are five, six like that. So they try to model the entire ionosphere across the country based on six data points and some more. And what they're trying to do is get as many data points to fill in and see, again, do the, does the model they're creating really show what's happening? Because if you go to the, that site, you can look at a map of the US and it shows, well, it's a moving map of what the changes in the ionosphere are. But a lot of that is just calculated. So the more data points they have that they can test it, the more they can say it's either right or we need to correct something. So all of this is to collect data. So this is just my plug here. Anything you do contributes. Just getting on the air contributes. The deeper, you know, as deep as you want to get into it, you can. And I uh, one of the other aspects of the conference, they were just hams that weren't necessarily affiliated. They weren't, you know, a researcher at a school or anything that really do some serious atmospheric research based on groups of people they know. And this is just another way that another group can help. Uh, and then of course, our little old FCC part 97, advance the radio amateur art or the radio art. So this is the way we can fulfill that, that challenge, I suppose, if you want to call it that they threw at us. And this is some acknowledgments. You can see that the National Science Foundation, uh, NASA, ARGC is another um, supporter. If anyone's familiar with ARGC, they, um, they fund a lot of amateur things, uh, amateur activities, like they're funding a lot of um, kitting of equipment for uh, interference testing at, in, at, at, for the different ARL sections. Uh, in the Eastern Mass, we have a set of equipment that they've provided for double troubleshooting or DFing interference, like line noise or any other kind of noise. Um, and of course, all of the different uh, networks that have supplied data to the research is listed here. But, I mean, NASA and NSF are investing serious money in this. Uh, so they have some faith that, um, that some value can be returned. So hopefully we'll return that. And I think that's all I have. Thanks. Does anyone have any questions? We have at least one question for Stan. Hold on one second. So uh, when the work was done in 2017, there were a certain volume of folks that were tracking data and that was fed in. And I'm curious if anything was found out from that that we didn't already know. And I, it, this second half, sorry. And is there something for the upcoming uh, uh, eclipses that, that we want to find out that we don't think we know yet? It, yeah, well, I mean, the short answer is I don't know. Um, I know that, I know down at Scranton, there are people working with the data that already exists. Uh, like I said, uh, on solar flares and actually Dr. Frizzell uh, has published a number of papers based on this. Now we're talking 50 page papers and I get to read them and tell them if he missed a comma, but you know, I can't go much beyond that. There's charts and graphs and you know pages of calculations. 
So what I can say is that it's being used. I, I can't evaluate <laughs> exactly what it is that they learned. I don't know if, um, if any of that, it's a suggestion I could make that there should be something up on that website that explain that at least kind of states what areas they're looking at. But yeah, I, I can't address that. Some of this data, I assume, can be used to reinforce assumptions that are already made about oh, yeah. the ionosphere and it may not be something new, but it's like, oh yeah. We were thinking that, but yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, like the models, is the model right? That reinforces, yeah, the model was right, or this theory. Um, and just kind of a, another sideline. I know that Christina has moved on to another school, and actually, there was a student there who was in the graduate program that had did, done some papers, and she's gone on to work at. Oh, in, in Virginia, there's there's a radar. It's got a strange name. It's it's a sideways facing radar that's used to analyze the atmosphere. And she's gotten a job there out of her work on these papers from this data. And because she got a job there and she had worked on that, she they hired her and then made her a liaison back to SAMSI for future work. So. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of aspects to this that are pretty interesting. Um, my name's Tim Casey One QDK. Uh, thanks for coming to talk to us today. And uh, I like the. I want just want to say a couple things. Uh, I like the idea of having a personal space weather station. That just sounds like a really fun thing to to have out on your porch you know like you were talking about and uh the other thing when you said that um digital modes are better and you get a more valuable report um i like hearing that also because um we often fight about that kind of thing and it's nice to hear someone who on our side on something <laughs> on that but um thank you and uh i'll hand it back to bill yeah well the so yeah well Obviously, the data that comes from Whisper, there's a lot more, you know, kind of calibrated data that comes from that, as opposed to the 599 or 59 signal report. Um, Even yeah. There was something else, something else you said. Uh, oh, yeah. I... I thought it was, I like it because one thing is we get together every morning on Zoom, our little group, and we look at these, among other things, we have all these projects we're working on, like <clears throat> like the grape stations, we're probably going to be shipping out this weekend or next week because we got to get them to people to set up before the eclipse. But we get together, like I say, every day and we'll look at this chart and say, what happened? You know, why is this different this day? So it, it's been a learning experience also. It's not just watch it, it's raining. It's, it's what's happening here. Yeah. Was there something else? You know the price class of the GDOs? Excuse me? You know the price class of the GDOs? The, the GPSDO? GPSDO? The Bodners run about 150 or $160. The um, grape two, um, the grape two is going to be a lot more complex than the grape one, and so it's only going to be, I think, right now, as something that's assembled. We are building our own grape ones, and to, to save money, uh, they're using a GPS. Uh, I forget the company, but a GPS chip built on, so they eliminate that price. Um, Well, it's got to it's got to be GPS synchronized. Right. 
Well, that's all inherent to the Bodner in this case. There's not, that's, yeah. Yeah, because we're trying to measure the milliseconds. So, is that it? Anybody on Zoom? I know I've been mostly watching oh. the room, but I'm not seeing. I'm not Any seeing questions anything. on Zoom? I'm not seeing any, but uh, very good. Well, again, I'd certainly like to thank uh, Stan for his presentation this evening. And uh, I, I think one one interesting takeaway too is uh, you know all data is good. You know, even if you have a, a a receiving whisper station on during one of these eclipses, you're you're gathering data even if you're not transmitting. So yeah. Um, you know, as they as they come up, uh, start one before you go to work or or do your thing. Retired people do, although they tell me that they're busier after they get retired. I don't yeah, know. We don't have any time off now. That, that's what I. We are work through the weekends. <laughs> but uh, very good. Uh, thank you very much again, Stan. Yeah. And uh, thank you everyone uh, for attending the meeting uh, this month. And uh, hope to see everyone uh, next month, seven three. Oh. What time is it? I don't know how long it took.